Thank you for being here on this Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Um, if you have a Bible, turn with me to not very much a Mother's Day passage, but <laughs> Daniel chapter 9, and we are going to do week two on easily the most challenging passage in the book of Daniel, and certainly one of the most challenging passages probably in the Old Testament. I mean, I, I don't know of a lot that are more difficult in a four-verse section uh, than this one. So, we're, we're going to do a little bit of repeat of last week, but we're also going to build off of it, and hopefully this will be more clear. You never know. Maybe it will be less clear by the time we're done, but I, we hope it will be more clear by the time we are done, and just as an encouragement to all of us, um, I may say something about this at the very end, but I don't think we should be people who, and I don't, I don't see this at all in you guys, but I, we as Christians should not be people who despise really working hard on a difficult passage. It is so easy to make fun of that and say, oh, come on, like, you know, how much time are we going to spend on this? How important is this really? But it is true that some of the clearest points in this passage we all agree on, and they're very essential about Christ's death, but there is a lot that is difficult here, and I think uh, there is something to be said for not despising the hard work. I mean, I'll put it this way. Uh, we don't tend to make fun of students who work really hard in their organic chemistry class. We don't tend to make fun of students who work really hard at calculus and whatnot in high school and college. But when we apply similar levels of intense thinking to the Bible, people go, oh, why are we wasting our time sometimes? And I, I don't, again, I don't see that at all in you guys, but that's just something we need to not uh, give into. Uh, we need to keep things in right proportion, but we should also not be afraid to really in, invest some mental energy in something that really is challenging and a little bit frustrating to get clarity on. So with that being said, uh, Greg, could you open us in prayer and then we yeah. will jump into part two. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for the privilege to yet again gather um, as North Avenue Church uh, for this Sunday school time. Lord, I'm thankful uh, for the opportunity here to study the book of Daniel. Lord, this has been an amazing study uh, for me personally, uh, but Lord, also, Lord, I know it's been good for all of us, and I'm, I'm thankful for how you've been working uh, in it, and I pray you'd continue to do that uh, starting today. Uh, Lord, as we tackle this very difficult text, uh, this passage, Lord, that has caused no end of debate and discussion um, and Lord, even though we, we are convinced of the direction we're going, we again ask for great humility. Lord, um, Lord, as there are many who would see it differently, and Lord, I pray that uh, we'd be able to show charity and grace uh, where there are disagreements. Um, but Lord, also know that it's a good thing to come down on a position. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you'll help us be clear in what we say and make the connections correctly and rightly, um, persuasively. Uh, and Lord, so we just commit our hearts, our minds, our words, everything about us to you. And I pray most of all that we would leave here with a greater appreciation for the work of our Savior uh, and your plan of salvation uh, that you've accomplished through him. So God, we just commit this time to you and uh, ask for your blessing upon it and your help throughout it. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and just maybe one more motivation to want to think about a difficult passage like this. Here's an, an, another reason. Uh, one thing would be this. Jesus refers to this passage when he mentions the abomination of desolation uh, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So in all th in the three what we call synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, Jesus refers to this, I think he's referring to these very verses, verses 26 and 27 of Daniel 9. In, in those three gospels, also the book of Daniel, uh, it's not Daniel, the book of Revelation in chapters 11, 12, and 13 references either three and a half years or time, times, and half a time, or, you know… 42 months. 42 months, yes. These different ways of speaking of uh, three and a half year period. That seems to be built out of Daniel's last 70th week that is split in half. So, several chapters of Revelation are impacted by how we understand this text, and several chapters in the gospel are impacted by how we understand this at times a little bit seemingly obscure part of this text. So it is relevant to how we interpret other parts of Scripture. Any introductory comments? Um, it's kind of related to Daniel, but it's just related to the study of Scripture in general. Um, you know, there's passages like this, guys, that can, that, that can cause a lot of discussion, debate, disagreement. Um, but if done rightly, issues like what we're looking at and texts that we're looking at and the surrounding, you know, theology, surrounding texts and how they all connect together, this can be one of the best ways to really get a firm grasp on Scripture. Um, a lot of the issues that I know very well 
I have learned because I have wrestled back and forth between different interpretations and different positions um, on, a, on a subject or on a passage of Scripture. And so let me just uh, encourage all of us that if we come to something difficult, you know, like you were saying, we don't want to shy away from that. No, let's press into that because some of my most fruitful study of the Word has come from wrestling with stuff like this uh, because I have to dig in. I have to look. I have to consider where I'm at. I have to consider texts that come before, texts that come after. How do those texts that come after use what I'm looking at? How is what I'm looking at building off of what I've already read? Um, I get such uh, an increase of my knowledge of Scripture, my understanding of Scripture. Um, and so like press in uh, with issues like what we're looking at here. It will only help you grow in your knowledge of the Word. And as we grow in our knowledge of the Word, we grow in our knowledge of God, our relationship with Him, and all of that. So, you know, take stuff like this, whatever the issue may be, whether it's a theological issue, whether it's, you know, you're dealing with predestination, free will, baptism, who, like, when you really dive into that, like, God will use that to help you get a grasp of the Word and how it fits together um, and there's few things that God will use to help you grow in your knowledge of the Word like that. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with you, Greg. I, unless you think it's just Greg or Mark or myself uh, sitting up here wrestling with this, I, I, I share with the guys that, um, and, and I use Calvin's commentary as, uh, somewhat this past week on this, and he has a number of dissertations that, uh, that he wrote or that others wrote going back to the first century uh, of, I mean, names like Luther and, and Jerome and, and others that, uh, uh, that they back to the early church that were wrestling with this same issue. So it's about wrestling with, you know, had different interpretations, debated, that type thing. And, and, and that's the way you learn by reading what somebody else said. In mm -hmm. fact, when we were talking um, about spiritual giftedness and secession, cessationism, uh, you know, to go back and look at the history of that whole issue in the church really is an edifying experience mm -hmm. because you realize, hey, we're not alone in trying to figure this out of what Scripture is really saying. And you grow in that and you get excited about it and you learn. And you say, wow, I didn't know they were debating that, you know, 400 mm -hmm. years ago, but they were. So, yeah. D Does anybody here remember back in probably the 90s, they used to have, when I was in young school, they would have these uh, images that were, they became three-dimensional if you stared at them long enough, and you would set them like a foot from your face, and you would start moving them, and eventually your eyes would sort of move a little bit, and suddenly, you'd, whoa, you can see some sort of three-dimensional image. Does anyone remember those things from a number of years ago? Okay, I would say passages like this oftentimes work this way for me. So when you first look at this crazy image from the 90s, where you can't tell what this thing is. It's just like these, this strange p set of patterns, and you're staring at it, you're going, I, everyone's going, oh, this is amazing. You're like, I don't, I see nothing. This is just confusion. <laughs> and you stare at it, and it takes time, and you put the thing a certain distance, you're supposed to move it, and your eyes sort of find the pattern, and you can suddenly see the three-dimensional image, uh, and then you're like, oh, I, I see it. I often find hard passages of the Bible are just like that. The, the beginning, you look at it, you go, I, I can't make sense out of this. There's 25 different interpretations. I'm never going to have any sense of certainty. And then you keep staring at it, working through it, reading people on it, and suddenly, oh, that makes sense. Oh, this connects with what Daniel said earlier. Oh, the number 62 has this symbolic value. Or this thing over here, oh, this connects to what Jesus said in Luke. Oh, that's why Jesus said, suddenly connections start happening. And it becomes three, it like pops out. You're like, oh, this actually does matter. This actually is pretty amazing what you can see here. But it takes that effort of staring at something for a while before it starts uh, becoming more clear. So with that said, I think we'll just jump in here mm -hmm. to remind you, if you don't remember from, from a couple weeks now, the first 19 verses of this chapter, Daniel is praying about the end of the Babylonian exile. Let me remind you of the beginning of the chapter, uh, verse, two, uh, verse 1, Daniel 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent Amid, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah, the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So Daniel sees the end of 70 years is coming near, and so he's praying for forgiveness and restoration and that God would bring the people back to their land. While praying, the angel Gabriel shows up to him and speaks to him. Look with me at verse 20. Uh, verse 20. 
while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. So this is supposed to give us insight. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. So Gabriel is going to try to bring clarity to this idea of the end of exile and what is coming in the future. And Greg, could you just read for us 24 to 27 so we can hear it again? All right, so let's read. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. So Greg, can you just kind of start to walk us back through the beginning of this passage? I will do my best um, not to rehash everything we said last week, but to hopefully cover it in a a fair way. So again, the 70 weeks is literally 77s, referring to uh, the week, a week of years. And so we're looking at a total of 490 years. Um, And as we argued, that doesn't necessarily have to be 100% literal. Um, And there's a lot of wide agreement on and seeing it that way. Um, But it's 70 weeks of years, roughly 490 years, um, are decreed about the people of God and the city of Jerusalem. And this is what is decreed. This is the goal of the 70 weeks. Um, And this is what we don't want to lose sight of, getting into the mix of all the difficulties of uh, 25, 26, and 27. This is the focus again, to finish the transgression, put an end to sin, atone for iniquity, kind of three negative aspects, and then three positive aspects to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. So that is the goal of these 70 weeks, is those six things. Um, a, A new holy most holy person thing, um, everlasting righteousness. I would think we could say the end, the completion of the prophetic ministry um, and of the gift of prophecy, uh, a final atonement for sin or iniquity. Uh, Sin will be brought to an end. Uh, Rebellion against God will be brought to an end. In some ways, we can see this pointing all the way to the very, very end and a new heavens and a new earth. Um, in some way. And we have to remember too, and this is something Fred and I were, were chatting about right before we started. Um, when you're in, it's, it's called the prophetic perspective. Um, I've heard it called prophetic foreshortening. You know, from the, from, the, from the perspective of the prophets, it's like you're looking at a mountain range and it looks like these mountains are actually, you know, right next to each other. And so from the prophetic perspective, all these events happen at exactly the same time. Um, but then when you actually start getting closer and you know this, you get to one mountain, you realize there's actually miles and miles and miles and miles between what looked at from a distance to be right next to each other. They're actually really far apart. Um, and so we have to keep that perspective in mind as well, uh, because some of these events, they have, they kind of have an initial fulfillment, um, around the time of Jesus, destruction of Jerusalem, but they're also indicators and they're, they're foreshadowing something even greater that's going to happen at the end. Um, so again, 77s to 70 weeks. And remember in verse 25, we talked about this. Again, the ESV is very unique on this for some reason. There's not maybe one or two other translations do this. Uh, when it talks about there will be, uh, verse 25, uh, from the going out of the word, 
to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. The seven should not be separated from the 62 in terms of the coming of this anointed one, this prince. Um, seven weeks and then 62 weeks, and then this anointed one, this prince comes. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, okay, so let me uh, pick up here for a second. Um, so some of the controversies here are these kinds of questions. When does the 490 begin? That's one big debate. Number two is, is the 490 weeks or, you know, 490 days, which is, could be symbolic of years, are, are they literal uh, years or not? Let, let me just give a couple things. I'll say a little bit more than I did last week. So reasons why we take the 70 times 7, not literally with a strict literalism, but symbolically, let me just list a number of reasons. I'll try to do this pretty quickly. Number one, uh, Strictly speaking, no one takes it literally because it doesn't say 490 years ever once in this passage. It says 70 times 7, 70 weeks. It, it never actually uses the term year to describe these. It's actually a symbolic number for 490 days. If you're going to take it with strict literalism, it doesn't say years. It says 70 weeks. And if you're going to take it with total literalism, that would be a year and a half, less than a year and a half. And no one, I don't know a single person who takes it that literally. So number one, Strict literalism doesn't even work here from the start. It never says 490 years. It says 490 days, and no one takes it as 400. I don't know a single person who takes it as a year and a half. Uh, because that would mean that from the time of Daniel, the Messiah would come, die for sin, and Jerusalem would be destroyed within a year and a half of the year 538 B.C., which is just nonsense. It just, that's, no one takes that view. Number two, Jeremiah's 70 years of exile were not a literal period of 70 years. They were literally 67 years. 605 B.C. to 538 B.C., 70 is a rounded symbolic number of completion, but it was not literally 70 years of exile. It was literally 67 years of exile. Number three, Jesus uses 70 times seven non-literally when he says you should forgive your repentant brother 70 times seven times. He doesn't mean the 491st time the person sins, you can go, ha, now I no longer have to forgive you. Jesus doesn't mean the numbers literally. He means them symbolically as a, there's never ending. There's never an end to the amount of times we should forgive a repentant brother. So to take Jesus' uh, 70 times seven literally would be to disobey the meaning. He doesn't want it to be taken literally. He wants it to be taken symbolically. Number four, 70 times seven is symbolic of a Jubilee, not just any jubilee, but a tenfold jubilee. Remember in Leviticus 25, we read it last week, seven times seven means 49 years, and every 49 years you, ha- you set the captives free, you cancel debt, you return people to their land, and there's this jubilee. It's this celebration every, every, 70, every seven times seven. But if you're doing 70 times seven, that's not one jubilee, that's 10 jubilees. This is symbolic for the ultimate setting the captives free, the ultimate release from the debts of our sins, the ultimate returning back to our homeland. This is the ultimate salvation period uh, that we see in Leviticus 25. So that's, again, it's a symbolic number. Number five, Nebuchadnezzar's time of insanity is called seven periods of time in Daniel 4.16. It doesn't even tell us how long. It's, the number seven is being used as a symbolic number. He was, he was insane for the perfect amount of time, seven periods of time. Uh, number six, the most likely starting date for the 490 periods of time is Cyrus's decree to send people home to rebuild, which is in 538 B.C. Now, if you go 538 B.C. and you add 490 literal years, you do not end up at the time of Christ uh, because it just, the math doesn't work there. So the most likely time to start the 490 doesn't actually end directly at the time of Christ, which I think, again, makes us think this is not literal. Number seven, and we'll get to this more in a moment. But, but some yeah. people try to make it, right. make it work. So they, they, they adjust, they maneuver just to make those numbers work out right, which yes. is not the way you interpret Scripture. Right. And, and another, another text I think is really big here is the uh, seventh reason is Okay, this is tricky because we haven't been in Revelation much in our church's history, but if you read Revelation 11, 12, and 13, you will notice how many times they refer to a three and a half year period. They, they, times, times and a half a time, 42 months, 1260 days, uh, three and a half years. Here, here's, we'll have to argue for this probably later, maybe not today, but I think a very, this may surprise you. I think a very strong argument can be made, based especially on Revelation 12, verses 5 and 6, that the three and a half year period, the last half of Daniel's 70th week, I think you can make a good argument that that three and a half years is a symbol, not for three and a half literal years, but for the entire period between Christ's first and second coming. 
Now that may sound totally unbelievable if you've never heard that before. I, when I first heard that, I thought that cannot be true. I'm challenging you on this. Revelation 12 verses 5 and 6 refers to the time of the persecution of the church. And the time starts what? When the son of the virgin goes to heaven. That's the ascension of Jesus. And it continues all the way until the very end. And it's called three and a half years. Why in the world would the author of Revelation describe the entire church age from Christ's ascension to his second coming as a three and a half year period? That doesn't make any sense since it's been 2,000 years. Why would you describe that as three and a half years? And the answer is this. In Jewish history, just hang with me here. In Jewish history, three and a half years took on a symbolic meaning because of what those, like, because of what it meant. If I say 1776, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Because you're an American. You know, 17, you know, immediately you know what 1776 means, right? We know, when a Jew hears three and a half years, you know what they're thinking? They're thinking of at least three events. Number one, Elijah, when he was being uh, persecuted and he was, the lo he, was, he was the only guy left in town going against the prophets of Baal, how long did God bring a drought on Israel because of Elijah's prayer and Elijah was persecuted by King Ahab and, and Jezebel? What, what, that was happening for how long? We're told explicitly several times, three and a half years. During that time, the true prophet was being persecuted by the authorities that be. God was bringing down judgment, but he preserved Elijah's life. And during that time, it was a three and a half year persecution. Okay, number two, the one we'll get to uh, in a couple weeks, Daniel 11, King Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He shows up in 167 BC, and what does he do? He kills Jews who obey the Torah laws. He kills them. You've got, you cannot circumcise your male sons. You, you, you must eat unclean food, all that stuff. How long does the intense persecution last that is talked about in Daniel 11? It's three and a half years. 167 BC to 164 BC, that's historically verified. It's a three and a half year period where King Antiochus pours out judgment on Israel and kills the faithful. Sounds kind of like Elijah's time. Then here's the other one. After the time of Christ... Rome surrounds Jerusalem with armies, and they, they bring a siege against Jerusalem. It is so horrific that mothers give birth to babies that starve to death, and the mothers, it is recorded by Josephus, some mothers boiled and ate the remains of their infant children to stay alive during the siege. It is a horror story of what happened. How long did, the, did that last? Three and a half years. 66, BC, 66 AD to 70 AD, it's a three and a half year period. So if you're writing Revelation in the 90s AD, and you say three and a half years, what is every Jew thinking? Three and a half years means really bad times. It means the world is persecuting the faithful and the faithful are holding fast to God and God is going to be faithful to get them through that horrific time. Happened to Elijah. Happened in the 160s with Antiochus. Happened in the 60s AD with the, with the, with the Jews in Jerusalem. And so when Revelation is written, it picks up on this language and says, there is an ultimate three and a half year period. And it lasts for the entire church age. Between the ascension and second coming of Christ, there is going to be a three and a half years that lasts for a long time. And during that time, the authorities that be are going to be what? Persecuting the church. Throughout the world, that's always been happening. More Christians have been killed in the last century than in the previous 19 put together, if you do the numbers on this. So the world is persecuting the church. We are in a time of tribulation, and we are enduring to the end faithfully. It's our three and a half years. That, that is the church age. And so I think you can argue that Revelation interprets the last half of Daniel's last week as being symbolic for the entire church age. So again, it shows again that we're not working with literal numbers, 490 years. We're dealing with symbolic numbers with sub symbolic uh, values. And again, this is not a form of lying. If I say it was raining cats and dogs, I'm not a liar. I'm using a form of speech. You know what I mean. Apocalyptic literature often uses symbols to, to illustrate real things. Daniel is full of apocalyptic imagery and symbolism that illustrates real things. The beasts coming out of the ocean aren't literal, but they do represent real cultural persecution from the authorities that be. And similarly, uh, the, the numbers being used here are not to be used in strict literalism, but this is apocalyptic literature and is often to be taken in a symbolic way. I'm going to say something. This is not original to me. Um, and I remember the first time I heard it, I thought it was pretty clever. But I think it makes sense of dealing with this type of literature. And it says, he was talking about specifically Revelation, but he was like, it doesn't mean what it says, it means what it means. And if you stop and just think about that for a second, the imagery isn't meant to be taken at face value. It's meant to communicate something deeper, more profound that connects to everyday life. So these kinds of things, that's why we, we, we don't take it just at face value. Yes, it's true, but it's a type of literature that invites us into what is being communicated by the image. We're not trying to, you know, um, create some kind of weird freakish science fiction, you know, comic book story as we read these things, they're meant to communicate realities that we encounter every day. 
Um, and the other thing too, thinking about the three and a half years um, and, and how this works, you think about, you know, there, there's this, when we get to Revelation and other stuff eventually, talk about various things, we can detail this more. But, you know, one of the, the as I mentioned earlier, the whole prophetic perspective, like they were looking for the new creation, this, this you know, heavens and earth were righteousness to well. All of this was going to happen at the same time. And one of the things that tripped up the Jews of Jesus's day was the fact that, yes, that age to come, that, that new creation, it started breaking into the current one, but not in full. Like it's, you know, it talks about 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. It's literally a new creation. So we are starting to taste of the new creation that's promised, just not yet in its fullness. And, and that's, that's why, why we look at folks like Antiochus Epiphanes, um, Titus who comes and, you know, with the armies of Rome destroys Jerusalem. Um, you know, we, we see clearly the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world and that spirit manifests itself against the church and against the truth in a multitude of ways throughout this three and a half year stretched period um, while still looking forward to, I believe, Believe this as uh, this final uh, embodiment, um, as is Scripture talks about. There is going to be this <clears throat> final end times opponent who manifests in the the worst possible way. Satan and his opposition to God, his opposition to truth, his opposition to the people of God. So that is coming, but the the, the end of all things is 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 here now in an initial sense, not in a full sense, in an initial sense. That's why we have this overlap. Yeah, we're experiencing eternal life now, but not yet in its fullness. We're new creations now, not yet in its fullness. We have, you know, redemption now, but we wait, you know, internally, we wait for the redemption of our bodies um, at the end, at the resurrection. And so we're kind of in this, this in between between phase right now, uh, this three and a half year tribulation. It's also, you know, the church going forth, preaching the gospel, the nations being drawn in, all of these things happening at the same time, awaiting this final culmination and consummation of all this stuff to come. And see, the angel Gabriel, you guys keep me straight here. Uh, Daniel was simply praying, when can we go home? Mm -hmm. You know, I, he was mm -hmm. confessing their sins, but he, he knew that the 70 years, and like you mentioned, time, I did a little calculation this morning, 605 minus 70 years is 535. That's pretty close to the 538 one, mm -hmm. Cyrus. So they're not exact dates, but they're approximation. Uh, he was praying, when can we go back home? Gabriel, Gabriel comes forth and, and, and gives him these 20, verses 24 through 27, uh, which is not necessarily what Daniel wanted to hear. He, he gave him these now 70, he, he thought it was going to be over in 70 weeks, 70 years. Mm -hmm. Now it's seven, 490 years and it's not all good news. There's going to be desolation. There's going to be tribulation. There's going to be trouble. The, the Messiah, yes, is going to come, which is the good news. All these six blessings, these six promises that are going to be filled in Messiah but he's going to be cut off, uh, and 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 there's going to be a desolation of the temple and Jerusalem. And they wanted to go back home because of one, the temple, and two, Jerusalem. That was their home, and the temple was where they worship. I think we'll see at the end of Daniel. There's probably not a need for a temple. There's probably not a need, you know, for a a holy place. Jesus is the holy place and he has come. And that's the good news in these mm -hmm. verses, I think. Oh, that's helpful. So let, let's jump back in here. I'm going to reread a little bit. Verse 24, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to, number one, finish the transgression, two, to put an end to sin, three, to atone for iniquity, four, to bring in everlasting righteousness, five, to seal both vision and profit, and six, to anoint a most holy place, or probably most holy one there. That would be Jesus himself. Okay, how is this all going to happen? Verse 25, know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks, and I want to say and 62 weeks, it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. So just follow me on this here briefly. I believe the 490 begins at the decree of Cyrus in 538 BC to go back and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. 
then the first seven periods of time, the first seven that he speaks of, I think that is the time between 538 and the time of Nehemiah, Ezra, and Malachi, and the beginning of the restoration of the, of the city, and all that stuff. That's completed by that time. And then you have 62 periods of time, 62 weeks that come after that. Those 62 weeks cover the time from the initial rebuilding of the, of the temple in the 400s all the way up to the time of Christ. So, so it, it covers uh, that, that whole period. That's the 62. If you put seven and 62 together, you get 69, right? The 69 weeks. Let me say something here I don't think we've mentioned yet, which is, first of all, why does it split the 69 weeks into two parts? Well, the first seven is the initial rebuilding stage. That makes sense. The other half, or the other portion is 62. Pretty obscure number. I looked it up. I could only find two other places in the entire Old Testament, or I think in the whole Bible, where the, where the number 62 is ever used. One is in a census in Chronicles, which is irrelevant to our discussion right now. But the only other time the number 62 appears, as I could find in the whole of the Old Testament, is also in Daniel. And it's Cyrus, or Darius's age at the it's time. He's 62 of, years it's, old. It, it, he is, he's, it says he's about 62 years old when he sent the people back from exile. Well, let's think about that. Could be that the only two uses of 62 relate to each other. Why symbolically refer to this period as 7 and 62? Because the guy who sends them home from exile was 62 when he did it. And so perhaps that's a connection even within the book of Daniel for those numbers there and the value. But more importantly, look, at, look again at verse 25. It says here that there's an anointed one, a prince, who will come after the 69 weeks and the troubled time. An anointed one, a prince. Now, if you can follow this here for a second, the, the other view, the view that we're really arguing against is known as the dispensational perspective on this, which has become very popular. In the dispensational view, one of the weaknesses of that view is they have to change the meaning of the word prince between two verses. So if this doesn't make sense, I need you to follow me again here. Middle of verse 25, it says, the coming of an anointed one, a prince. Do you see that? So there is no question the coming of an anointed one, a prince, after the 69 weeks, I mean, there's almost universal agreement. That is Jesus the Messiah. So Jesus is called two things. He's called Meshiach, Messiah, anointed one. He's also called, uh, I think it's the word uh, Negim or something like this. It's the word for prince, okay? So Jesus is called Messiah and prince in verse 25. That's pretty easy. But here's where it gets tricky. Verse 26, after the 62 weeks, an anointed one, a Mashiach, a Messiah, shall be cut off and shall have nothing. Clearly, we're still talking about who? Jesus. Jesus. So, the, Jesus is Messiah, a prince, in the previous verse. In this verse, a Messiah, that's Jesus, is going to be cut off and have nothing. So, this is the death of Jesus. But then here's where it gets interesting. Verse 26, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city. Now, do you see? We've just heard of a, we hear of a Messiah in both verses. Who is it? Jesus, right? Verse 25, verse, an anointed one, a Messiah is coming. In both verses, it refers to Jesus. In, the, in verse 25, he's called both Messiah and a Negim, a prince, right? In the very next verse, both Messiah and prince re recur again. Verse 26, you have Messiah and prince. Again, the most, now just hear me out on this, the most obvious referent is that both Messiah and prince refer to the same person in both verses. The contextual evidence is overwhelmingly strong. The Messiah in verse 25 is Jesus. The Messiah in verse 26 is Jesus. The prince in verse 25 is Jesus. The prince in verse 26 is Jesus. If you take the dispensational view, you have to say, now follow this here. This is going to be complicated. The prince and Messiah in 25 are Jesus. The Messiah in 26 is Jesus. But the prince in 26 is the Antichrist. What? Contextually, there is no ground for that. The, the, you cannot switch the same two words for Jesus, and in the next verse, you switch the one to Antichrist. No, the words are all referring to Jesus. And when it says here in verse 26, look, look with me again, verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, so this is at the end of the 69 weeks, moving into the 70th week, an anointed one shall be cut off. So the Messiah dies in the 70th week and shall have nothing. That's Jesus' death on the cross. And the people of the prince who is to come, that would be who? The Jewish people. The people of Jesus, the people of the Messiah is the Jewish people, right? The people of the coming Messiah are the Jewish people. So, who, listen, who called crucify, crucify him? This is not anti-Semitism. This is just, what did the Bible say? The Jewish people cried, crucify him. So, the people of the coming Messiah, the people of the coming prince are the ones responsible for his death. 
Therefore, God brings judgment back on the Jewish people. How? 40 years later, Rome destroys Jerusalem all over again in 70 AD. So look at this, verse 26. After 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and have nothing. And the people, the Jewish people of the prince of Jesus, the Messiah, who is to come shall destroy the city and it, the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood. And to the end, there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. Now, do you see this? You say, the Jews didn't destroy Jerusalem. The Romans did. Well, yeah, but that's, that's not quite true, is it? Why did God bring the Romans to destroy Jerusalem? Because the Jewish people were rebellious crucified the Messiah. And, were and they rebelled against, against the Messiah. So think about this. Why is it the people of the coming prince, the people of the Messiah, are going to be responsible for destroying the city? They're not going to do it themselves, but their sin is why God had it happen. So they are responsible for the destruction of their own city because God sent Rome to do it. Just like was Israel responsible for the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem? Yes, because of their sin. So I, I think you see here a strong argument that the prince who is coming is, again, Jesus, and his people are the Jews, and they are the, their sin is what's responsible for the destruction of Jerusalem. This is not talking about an antichrist coming in the future primarily. The, the referent here directly is the destruction of the city of Jerusalem in AD 70 within 40 years of the death of the Messiah who was cut off and had nothing. Uh, Greg? Um, wow, a lot, a lot I could say on that, but yes, absolutely agree. Um, and again, you might say, well, if the Jews didn't technically do it, how can you say they're the ones who did it? Think about Peter preaching at Pentecost. What did he say to the Jews he was preaching to, talking about the Lord that you crucified and killed? Which the Romans actually did. Technically, the Romans did. But the blame was laid at the feet of the Jews on that. And so it's not out of step to, to say this is the same thing happening. Yes, the Jews... Um, you know, they were the ones who killed the Messiah. God's wrath comes on them for rejecting his son. But also, historically, the Jews were the ones who rebelled against Rome and brought the Roman invasion upon them. That destroyed them. Yes, Rome destroyed Jerusalem, but it was because the Jews rebelled against Rome. So in both cases, they might not be the technical ones who did it, but they are the ones at whom the, 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 the blame is laid at their feet. Um, and so... Um, in light of that, it says, verse 27, he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week and for half of the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. Now, there's a couple of ways you could take this, but first, who's the he? Yeah. Again, I think we mentioned this last week. Who's the he? It's the same he who is the anointed one, the prince, and then the anointed one who's cut off and the prince whose people destroy the sanctuary. There has not been a change in who this individual is. Totally. And so we have to see this as referring to Jesus. Obviously, we know the full, his death, resurrection, all of that. But look at verse 27 again. He shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. There's been some who I think may have rightly suggested you know, he laid down his life, uh, referring to Isaiah, other places, for the many. Who's the many? It's the one he makes this covenant with. Um, and and, and it, it's not just necessarily an empowering of a previous covenant, but an installation of, a, of the new covenant. I mean, again, Je Daniel's already referenced Jeremiah, and we know Jeremiah 31 is all about the new covenant that's coming, not like the old one. Why would this Messiah, who's ushering in all these things, bring in a covenant that is not going to be permanent? No. I think this is a reference to him confirming a new covenant. Um, and because that new covenant is fulfilled, sacrifice and offering is done away with. There's no more need for it. Why? Because it's all fulfilled in him. Go back to what we said, verse 24, which is the control and the key to this. What is this um, Messiah going to bring in <clears throat> at the end of the 70 weeks? He's going to put an end to sin and atone for iniquity. He's going to bring in everlasting righteousness. Um, again, what did sacrifice um, and all of that bring about? Sacrifice and offering was to deal with sin and bring righteousness. That's being done away with, with this anointed one who brings it to an end. We know ultimately because all of that is fulfilled in himself on the cross. This is huge. And so I want to remind you of something from last Sunday. This is a big interpretive piece to this whole thing. Verses 26 and 27, we are arguing, is ordered not A, B, C, D in chronological order, but that it's written the way Hebrew poetry and Hebrew, well, Hebrew prose is often written, which is that you repeat things and say things slightly differently. So again, 26 is A, B, 27 is A, B all over again. If you split the verses in half, the first half of 26 parallels the first half of 27. They're describing the exact same thing. 
So the, the Messiah being cut off in 26 is the same as the new covenant being formed between he and his people in verse 27. Do you see? When Jesus dies, what happens? The new covenant is, is established. The first half of 26 is Jesus dying, the Messiah. The first half of 27 is the new covenant being kicked into action by Jesus' death. So beginning of 26 parallels to be, beginning of 27. Now, the second half of 26 parallels the second half of 27. It's B, B. So look at the end of, look at, again, uh, middle of 26, second sentence. And the people, that's the Jews, of the prince who is to come, that's Jesus, shall destroy the city, that's Jerusalem, and the sanctuary. It's in, this is AD 70, shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. Pause there. Do you remember Jesus saying, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that the abomination of desolation has come near. Let the reader of Daniel understand. Jesus is referring to this very verse right here. Jesus goes, listen, the sign that this city is about to be wiped out all over again is when the Roman armies, Luke uh, says this, Luke 21, when you see Roman legions surrounding Jerusalem, know the abomination of desolation is here and run from the city because they're about to bring this thing down to the ground. They're going to level the city. So the desolations and abominations predicted here are what Jesus references in, for instance, Matthew Matthew 24, verse 15. Now, that parallels the second half of verse 27. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate. Does the word desolate sound familiar? He just used the word desolations at the end of verse 26. Desolations are decreed. Here's what they are. If you're getting confused here, back to the end of verse 27. On the wing of abominations, think abomination of desolation. On the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate. This is the Roman army led by Titus. Until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. That may be the ultimate overthrow of the Roman Empire later on down the way, which has already been predicted in, in Daniel when the stone hits the statue and the whole thing crumbles down. But however you look at it, the destruction of Jerusalem is the subject matter in the second half of verse 26 and the second half of verse 27. The Messiah is the subject matter in the first half of verse 26 and the first half of verse 27. It's all, this, it's all happening uh, really with the destruction of Jerusalem there in AD 70 and the death of Christ. Papa? The commentators agree with what Mark just said. Uh, some of them. Some of them do. <laughs> but they also use Josephus as the Jewish historian yeah. to corroborate this these are Josephus' own words. He actually fought for the Jews at first, was surrounded. He was so uh, effective that Vespasian made him, uh, moved him over to the, Rome, to the Roman side. But this is before he turned coat. Here's where he, this is what he wrote. For that it was a rebellious temper of our own, meaning the Jewish, that destroyed it, Jerusalem. And that they were the tyrants among the Jews who brought the Roman power among us who unwillingly attacked us and occasioned the burning of our holy temple. Titus Caesar, who destroyed it himself, is himself a witness who during the entire war pitied the people who were kept under by the rebellious and did often voluntarily delay the taking of the city and allowed time to the siege in order to let the authors have their, the authors of the rebellion have opportunity for repentance. So he corroborates mm -hmm. what Bible commentators say. So. Well, I think, too, one, one last thought here. You know, we talked about kind of the stretching out of the, the three and a half weeks indicative of the entire church, uh, you know, time of the church before, you know, Jesus comes back. Another thought here is you got to think about the, the language at the end of verse 26, talking about it's in the city shall come like with a flood and to the end, the end of the city, the end maybe beyond that. There shall be war, desolations are decreed. Desolations may be more than just the desolation of Jerusalem. Um, and then, the end of verse 27, there is an end point for the desolator. And you have to remember, um, we've already been dealing with all these huge, scary, freakish beasts that are these world empires, you know, dominating, fighting. There's wars. I mean, the 490 years talks about a troubled time. Think the images of the beast that we've already looked at. The, the, the raising up of massive empires, them being invaded, overthrown, changes of governments. Like this is something that is going to continue on until the end. The, the spirit of these beasts uh, will one day be finally brought to an end. The, you know, we talked about uh, Daniel 7, the, the, the son of man and, and the coming kingdom and the saints being given that kingdom. That, like, I think it's still pointing forward and pushing us to think bigger than just the, the destruction of Jerusalem. 
All of church history is a time of war and tribulation as empires rise and fall. And through it all, the people of God keep their eyes on Jesus. We look towards the end, um, the, the final completion, when all of these beasts and the enemies of God and these rebellious leaders are finally once and for all destroyed. And I think the good news is there at the end of verse 27, the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. There is a time coming a certain time in God's mind when all this worldly rebellion will be absolutely, finally, forever crushed and it will never rise again. That's good news. That, that is really good news. And I know we're almost over time here, but I want to say one last thing. A look at verse 27, the beginning. If, if we are correct in our interpretation, and he, that would be the Messiah, shall make a strong covenant with the many for one week, and for half the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offerings. So let me just tell you two ways people who take our view can interpret this, and we lean towards one of the two, but it's hard to know for sure. So we know the Messiah dies after the 69th week, somewhere in the 70th week. The question is where? So here's two options. Option number one, Jesus may die at the very beginning of the 70th week because the new covenant lasts for the whole week. So it could be the beginning of the 70th week is Jesus' death, the end of the 70th week is the return of Christ, and the middle of the 70th week is the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 when animal sacrifice was cut off. That's one possible way. I, I see that as being attractive. I'm not sure. The other option, which may be more likely, is that the 70th week begins somewhere in the life of Christ, maybe at his baptism, somewhere early in his life and ministry. The middle of the 70th week is his actual death on the cross where animal sacrifice is done away with in principle. And then the last half of the 70th week is the entire rest of the church age, according to Revelation 12 and places like that. But either Jesus dies to start the 70th week or he dies in the middle of the 70th week, but somehow the Messiah dies in the 70th week, his death leads to the end of animal sacrifice, and we believe that the second half of the 70th week <laughs> covers the entire church age, from Christ's resurrection and ascension to his final return based on Revelation 12, 5 and 6, and other passages like that. All right, we gotta stop. Uh, Papa Fred, can you close us in prayer? Yes, thank you, Mark. Lord Christ, thank you that, uh, thank you for uh, this afternoon, uh, I, I get stimulated and excited just to have the opportunity to open, open the book to Daniel 9. This, is, this has been fun. Uh, it's been uh, exhilarating for me and the guys. I think uh, you've, you, you've shown us, Father, clearly in Daniel that Christ is our only hope in, in a time of darkness. Um, you know, sacrifices and burnt offerings were the way which... Uh, before sinful men and sinful women were to approach God. And now we know that that, that has, that those offerings, those sacrifices have been done away with. And in Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10, we know that uh, you died once for all. And uh, the, the need for a temple, the need for these sacrifices was completed in you. And we just raise our hands in praise and thanksgiving and doxology to you and for you and for that great sacrifice. And the good news in Daniel, even though we've got a lot of desolations thrown in, we know that these desolations will continue to that great stone. It's the statue at, at your great homecoming. And uh, we can't wait. Uh, Lord, I pray for our service. I pray for the, the singing. I pray for the preaching and the prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we have got three chapters left, and Lord willing, I think we'll be able to do it in three weeks. And then uh, the first Sunday of June, we will not have Sunday school in here. We'll take one week off the first Sunday of June, and then we'll pick back up, I think on the June, I think it's the 12th or something, wherever the date is, uh, the second Sunday of June, we'll pick back up in here, Lord willing, and we'll, we'll finish Wayne Grudem's book on uh, his eschatology section. So a lot of end time stuff this year, and then we'll move on from that, hopefully at the end of the summer. Thank you.